right, all right, all right. Welcome once again, everyone, to your weekly Wednesday night webinar with myself, Dr. Patrick McGrath, Chief Clinical Officer at NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app. You can get through Google Play or iOS. Check us out. And if you're looking for teletherapy throughout the U.S., Canada, Australia, or Great Britain, we are here for you. Or I guess the United Kingdom is the, uh, the way they're saying it. Uh, more than happy to have all of you here with us uh, tonight. And uh, we have a guest. Hi, Nick. How are you? Good evening and afternoon to all of you. <laughs> and morning, maybe, if you're in Australia. Who knows what Absolutely. time it is, right? Yeah. Um, Nick, why, why yes, are sir. you on Why are you on my show? What's going on? What What brings you here this this You know, the, the fates, control. as they would have it, um, <laughs> have you know, diagnosed me with OCD and have also brought me to, uh, through no CD to recovery, the journey, um, the treatment and a relative and decent amount of success, um, especially over the past year. And so wow. wanting to share that progress with people who are at different stages of that journey, maybe the very beginning, maybe the pre stages, maybe the thick of it or in their recovery as well. I've always wanted to share some of that and, you know, connect with others in that way. Well, fantastic. Appreciate that. And I'll, I'll ask you questions. Uh, you can you can answer as much or as little as you are comfortable with. No one has to come on here and divulge everything or anything whatsoever. But um, if if you're up for it, do you do you mind sharing a little about your OCD experience and journey into and through therapy and what it's been like afterwards? That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's it's a long one because it's pretty much my whole life ever since maybe five years old, let's say, um, there would be a theme here or there. And I had those tendencies and uh, the obsessions and some compulsions. Um, it was around, I think, the high school age. Um, it got decently bad. And I knew I had, um, I was kind of self-diagnosed with OCD because I learned a little bit about, a little bit about what it actually is um, compared to what the media or most people think OCD is. Obviously, we, we've all heard the stereotypes and the the false information about what OCD looks like and how it works. Um, but once I started to learn a little bit about the anxiety and uh, the obsessions and whatnot, I was like, oh, that definitely sounds like what I've always kind of had and how my brain kind of works. But I didn't really do anything about it, didn't think I needed to. And a lot of themes, I kind of, you know, weighted them out. Um, not the best method, but that's just kind of was my go-to. That's all I knew. It wasn't until post-COVID uh, and quarantine um, I remember like some themes were popping up and like, I was just, I just figured, you know what, it's a stressful time. And I've always had these tendencies. Um, I'm probably obsessing over random things, um, just because of that high stress and like, you know, the, the state of the world and kind of where it's put me at. Um, I didn't think it was anything different till the end around the end of November, 2020 is when, um, a new theme popped up that I had never had before. And for me, it happened to be harm OCD, um, for mm -hmm. others that, you know, it could always be any theme. doesn't matter. Um, for me, it happened to be that one. And I remember at the end of November, I was trying to do my usual, like, oh, okay, I'm obsessing over something. I'm struggling with it. I'll just either wait it out or talk it out or, you know, with friends, or I was seeing a therapist at the time, talk therapist. And she was great, but, you know, I, I obviously just tried to like, well, let's talk this out. Let's, let's figure out what's going on or why I'm obsessing over things. Let's get to the root of it. And it wasn't working. And I was like, okay, something, this is a tougher one. And it was causing a lot of anxiety. And I just remember it like persisted for like about a week or so longer than it usually does. And it was, um, I noticed it was a lot more of an intense anxiety, a lot like bigger of a trigger. Um, it was really sticking with me and it wasn't going away. Um, and that panic was like really intense. Um, I ended up going to the hospital. I did not, um, I didn't get admitted. I just, they prescribed me some light uh, anti-anxiety medication um to take as needed or whatever as, and as maybe, they do yes <laughs> right and i even told them i was like i don't think any like you know any harm is going to happen it's just I, i'm just thinking about it and it's giving me anxiety i, I was i told them that because for fear of being misdiagnosed or something right and then i was formally diagnosed i through a, a kaiser appointed uh doctor um that i saw virtually um and so he's like okay this is ocd and but didn't tell me much about treatment or what to do really about it other you know other than some reassurances, which obviously in the long run weren't helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, like, oh, I'm not crazy, probably not going to do anything violent, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And which helped for a time, felt nice to hear. Um, but of course it came back. And then through that that month, I remember I'm like, you know what, this is really an issue. And I don't know what's going on. Like it was a scary and dark time. And so I eventually um 
just said, you know, what? I'm going to I'm going to look up more OCD things. Is there a specific treatment? Is there something, you know, specifically tailored towards OCD and its treatment um, that can, you know, is out there in this world um, through the Internet? And so that's how I came to find OCD. Um, and I immediately booked a session. I said, I don't even care who the therapist is. Give me someone as soon as who's available. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Like <laughs> I didn't I didn't shop around. I didn't browse. I said, this sounds this sounds like exactly what I needed. And so I started seeing a therapist as soon as I could. Only It was only less than a week, I think, before they hooked me up. Um, and I started learning about ERP. I started on my own first because I was sure. cause there was mentions of it and whatnot. And I was exploring the app, getting to know uh, ERP and how that works. And it was mind-blowing because it was so much education in such a short period of time learning about this disease. It's like, wow, I never knew any of this. I've had this my whole life. Never yeah. thought to actually delve into it. And that information isn't readily available, it seems. Um, it's not really out there much. Um, and so that's why the more I learned, the more I was getting in, you know, gathering this passion and interest and in learning as much as I can and maybe helping others. And so the treatment was a hell of a treatment. Um, it, it was very tough. It was not the easiest thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, but as I started to over, it took a few months before I was even like noticing the panic going down and the anxiety and the terror that, you know, all those obsessions were causing. But once it finally got to that point, I realized, okay. I think I'm starting to get the hang of this. And I think this is like, I, I was learning a lot and it gave me a lot of uh, wisdom I didn't have before and life experience. And it's applied and helped me out in life in other areas that don't even have to do with OCD. Um, so a lot of that treatment was something not only beneficial for my OCD, but for just me as a person. And so once I, um, I completed the intensive part of the treatment, it became something that I noticed was really valuable and I wanted to spread that message. Well, thanks for being here tonight and helping spread that. And I know that it's always inspiring for people who who join us to to hear from people who have gone through the treatment. Everyone hears me yap every week about how this stuff works and everything like that. But it's nice now and then to have someone else. And by the way, if you're listening and you want to be in that screen where Nick is ever, please reach out to us. Let us know. We would we would be more than happy to talk to you as well, too. So. You know, Nick, one of the things that we like to do is now and then I'll sprinkle some stuff in with you, but we also like to go through questions and, mm -hmm. and talk about therapy, especially maybe tonight as we get to some harm OCD questions. I'd love to have some opinions from you on some of those yeah, things absolutely. as well, too, having gone through some of that stuff. So let's go with the first one. It's uh, from Emily who says she's been suffering from relationship OCD for many years now, even when... Uh, she uh, doesn't have anxious thoughts. She has an anxious feeling and just feels like something is wrong. And now she's afraid the truth and fears that truth is that she might need to leave her relationship. Doesn't want to leave the fear of uh, wonders if she's in denial. How can I get rid of nagging feelings? I'm afraid it will never leave. I'm sure you had that kind of experience as well, too. What was yeah, it? Absolutely. How, do, how did you kind of sit with that or live with that notion of, of a feeling that you didn't like and the fear that it would never leave? Yeah, the, the key there that like sends the, the lights off for me is when someone says, how do I get rid of this feeling, um, which yeah. is kind of in itself the problem. That's that's what I realized pretty early on. I was like, I had these feelings, thoughts and urges. And I'm like, hmm, how do I how do I stop them? How do I you know nip them in yeah. the bud? How do I get rid of them? And that obviously never ended up being the answer at all. It was so how do I just have them and, you know, and in a way live with them and on the daily. And once I figured that out, it was it was tough. It's not an easy, quick fix. But once I started to practice doing that, as scary as it was, it started to kind of disappear on its own. Um, you know, every now and then the, the feelings still are there. Um, but to get rid of them never was the was supposed to be the goal. It wasn't it wasn't the the answer. Yeah, I would agree. I when when someone says to me, I want to get rid of X, Y or Z, I always say, well, th this is the wrong therapy for you then. Right. Because. Our, our goal is never to get rid of something because I, I don't even know how to get rid of a thought for myself. I mean, there's, there's thoughts I've had for 20 years that I wish would go away and that pop into my head once in a while. I, I don't know how to make them go away. That's, that's not the goal of it. It's to be able to recognize that when they're there, like, oh, there's that thing again. Okay. And then be able to move on from that kind of experience. And when, when you were first learning about that, especially with harm, was that difficult to accept that you wouldn't be getting rid of the thought, but that you'd be actually learning how to live with the fact that it was there. Yeah, because I kept trying to find a, a quick and easy answer. Even after that, I'm like, okay, okay, I accept that. Let me let me get reassurance from that thought. Like, oh, okay, I have to sit with those feelings. And then like my brain would, it, it wasn't letting me take the easy way out and quickly accept, you know, there's no shortcut to getting to acceptance. You can't just say, okay, 
I get it. I just learned how to deal with this. Now it should work. Um, I had to practice it and do it daily. Um, for me, like the first thing I did when this theme came up was I got rid of all knives and started hiding like certain mm -hmm. things. I had this decorative samurai sword. I hit it. Um, I was like, yeah. oh, I could do something horrible with this. And so over time I started, I still have it here. I carry this. Um, you can see it. This <laughs> oh, yeah. I carry this with me at all times. Um, I keep it in my backpack. I bring it everywhere I go. Um, and yeah, at first it was terrifying just having it on my desk. Sometimes I'd want to throw it away or, you know, toss it, get it as far away from me as possible, lock it in a drawer or something. Um, and now I usually don't even think about it or even realize it's there like 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, and so, yeah, it's difficult to accept. It's difficult to get to that point because it's, there's no shortcut. It's, it's hard work and practice, um, you know, pushing yourself and learning to live with that. Bastion says, can you suffer from gender identity OCD when you are transgender? Well, any any question that we've said on here that says, can you, uh, we typically say, yeah, why not? Uh, because OCD will pick on anything that it possibly can. Uh, suddenly, I keep having intrusive thoughts about this, although I'm so happy I transitioned. Well, uh, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, OCD can take on the fear of anything and lead you to suffer about anything, even if it's something that you're very happy about. You may love your family and then worry that you might harm them. I mean, Nick, that might have been kind of in your case, going back to the samurai sword experience as well, too. I'm very happy with my family. I'm so glad I live with them. What if I kill them all? Right. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We get there's you get that question a lot, I think, where it's can OCD or can OCD yes. make you do this? Or yes. it's it's like, well, you just asked it. So the answer is yes, because you asked <laughs> it. You're already doing it. Right, right. Now, I think one of the reasons people ask that is because if I were to say no, then they would be like, Oh my gosh, so what does this mean about me then? Because you know, that that McGrath guy said no. So then it must mean that the that this isn't OCD. And now, now I have to deal with the fact that this is real. So sometimes I think there's a bit of a reassurance aspect to those questions yeah. like uh, that we do, but I'm happy to answer them here and to help people. But what I want you to be able to do is go beyond what we talked about here and really seek out then a therapist who can help you through this kind of experience so that you don't have to suffer with that, right? Because I'm sure you felt very alone at times, Nick, with OCD and, and like you had to isolate yourself and be away from others. And that Definitely. was the only way to keep everybody else safe and secure, right? Definitely. Brian says, hey, Dr. McGrath, my thoughts keep telling me that I'm someone else and that I'm not really who I am. Then I start feeling different. How should I deal with this? Well, one of the first things that I do is, again, get something that we've talked about already tonight work on this idea that just because i think something doesn't make it true so uh there's there's times that i've gone into sessions with people and nick maybe we could role play this a little uh, nick pretend you're the therapist for a minute all right and i'll come in to see you and say dr nick my skin is green today now nick do you think you'd believe me if i said that my skin was green as the therapist probably not okay uh, how about as someone with OCD, if I'm the therapist and I said to you, uh, Nick, I'm, I'm very pleased with our session today. And I just want to thank you for not mentioning the fact that my skin turned green last night. Uh, you would probably look at me like, what the hell are you talking about, Dr. Right. Barth? Why, why are you saying this? Right. And I could go on and on and say, well, no, I mean, I know that, you know, my skin's green and I, and I really appreciate the fact that you, you're not making fun of me about it. And, and after a while, you'd probably get annoyed and you'd be like, why the heck do you keep saying that your skin is green, right? And I'd say, well, my thoughts keep telling me that they are, so it must be true. And and there's a notion that we all seem to hold on to, right? And OCD takes advantage of, which is if you think something or if you feel something or if you have an image of something or if there's an urge you experience, it must be true, it must be real, and you're on the verge of doing it. It's on the verge of happening. Nick, for you, when you were, you know, first asked to hold on to a knife around people, what was it like to now have to face that urge of harming people or the thought of what if I were to do, or even the image of taking that knife and plunging it into somebody? Right? Yeah. For like, I was, um, 
the big one for me was like, oh, what if I, you know, stab myself or do something violent to myself? And it was, okay. so, the, you know, I couldn't even hide from, uh, couldn't even hide from myself. You know, I couldn't isolate myself from people. It was me I was afraid of. And I remember when I first started to learn to just sit with it and not seek reassurance, um, it was like, well, this is, it's a guarantee that this is going to happen. It's, it's going to sure. happen. Like this is, you know, in my mind, it was, it was hundred percent. I was convinced, um, because I felt these things and I wasn't doing anything about it. You know, I wasn't calling 911 immediately. I wasn't, uh, you know, seeking reassurance from someone or having them, you know, sit with me to make sure I don't do anything. Um, and I'm, you know, letting, leaving this knife in my room at night, you know, before I go to bed, it was, it was so certain in my brain that like, oh no, it's, it's going to happen. It's, it's a guarantee. And then it didn't. And then the next time I did it, same thing happened <laughs> for, for a time that was happening regularly. It's like, it's, it's going to happen again this time for sure. It's, it's already, I can feel it. It's, the anxiety is real. Everything's real. The feelings are real. Um, it's going to happen for sure. Guarantee. And then it didn't. And then a week later it, it happened for multiple weeks before I started to realize, wait a minute, I'm starting to notice something here. <laughs> there might be a pattern to this <laughs> not happening thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I OCD almost instills the, the forgetfulness of that, right? Like that you, you, you forget that it didn't happen. Uh, you, you just think you were very lucky, mm -hmm. but today's, today's the day. Today's the day. So the, the luck has finally run out. Today's going to be the day and everybody better be careful. Right. Yeah. We're searching for that, that one reassurance, that one compulsion that gets you there. It's like, okay, now that's, that's the one I did it. So this time I got lucky, but I gotta, at least I gotta find something that'll make it a hundred percent so that it'll never happen. But Nick, course, was there ever a chance that someone could have talked you out of being afraid? I'm pretty sure they would have if it was possible because mm -hmm. I, I sought it. I sought everything. I looked for it everywhere and from right. everyone. So exactly. And we say that all the time that I've never once in 22 years of treating someone with OCD talked to them. And afterwards they said, oh, well, I'm good now. Thanks. OCD has gone. You've you finally convinced me I'm not going to do blank or, or whatever. Yeah. It's just not the way it is. Doodle Dial says, hello and good afternoon. There's one of your afternoons, Nick. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> How would you advise someone with moral OCD to go about dealing with anxiety that stems from occasionally holding moral or ethical views and opinions that differ from the mainstream? Well, uh, first of all, what's the mainstream? I don't even know. I mean, we have debates going on currently politically all over the place around many hot topic issues about uh, equality, abortion, all sorts of things. Which which ones are the mainstream views? Which ones are the quote unquote right or wrong views in those types of situations? Uh, and how do you know which side you're supposed to be on? Or is it okay to have an opinion? I think is really what it comes down to. And of course, moral OCD says, uh, well, the only opinion to have is the right opinion. The problem, of course, is how does one identify what the right opinion is in any given situation? Right? Uh, I just watched the the dropout on Hulu, and it's about the Theranos uh, case, and and it was really fascinating. Where there were some whistleblowers, and one of them was the grandson of one of the board members, and. And the grandson was saying, some things are going very wrong here. And the board member was saying, no, you're wrong. Everything's fine. It turns out the grandson was very right, right? So in that situation, it appears. So um, what is what is the right opinion? And, and I think when we're looking at it from that kind of point of view, we can really see the OCD here in Dudu Dial's question, wanting to know, is it okay almost to have opinions that differ from the mainstream? And how then do I deal with feeling uncomfortable about that? So one of the exposures we do with people, of course, is to allow for discomfort, right? That if your goal is to get rid of discomfort, all you are going to be is uncomfortable, right? Yeah, and sure. Nick, maybe you found that too. You probably spent a great amount of time trying not to be uncomfortable. Did it ever bring comfort to you? No, never. Not once. Not once. Mm -hmm. Ooh, we got a thumbs up on that one even too. Nice. All right. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs> um, it is, it is so hard to not be uncomfortable when the goal 
is to not be uncomfortable. I I have actually found so much more comfort in people like yourself, Nick, that once you accepted the fact that it was okay to be uncomfortable, your life got better and easier to live. But it was so much more difficult when your number one goal was to do anything possible to make sure there was no discomfort whatsoever. Yeah, I, I remember a good practice for me was minor dealings with like somatic OCD because that's all about just pure discomfort, you know, sure. even physical. And mm -hmm. I noticed like, you know, the more I would try to make sure that those, I wasn't focusing on those physical things that were distracting me or bothering me or usually would happen at night when I'm trying to sleep, keeping me awake. The more I would try, the more of a problem it was and I wouldn't sleep. Whereas if I just said, you know what, I'm going to sit with this and be uncomfortable and it's going to keep me up all night. If I fully, when I delved into that and sat with it, I would fall asleep every time. I wouldn't, you know. Here's here's one of the more interesting aspects of that and, and to look at a somatic experience. I've worked with people who were so afraid to go to bed and then have to wake up and go to the bathroom and that that would disrupt their sleep. So they literally did not go to sleep because they spent all night in the bathroom trying to make sure that they could squirt out all of the urine that they could possibly have inside of them. And then what happened? They didn't sleep. So had they gone to sleep and woken up and gone to the bathroom and gone back to bed, they would have at least gotten some sleep, right? Right. But in the attempt to make sure that their sleep wasn't interrupted, they got no sleep whatsoever. And, and somehow in the world of OCD, that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. That is, that is a darn good idea to OCD even though no one else would say that was a good idea whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, it's that OCD <laughs> logic right there. It operates there by its own it. rules. Yeah. That's why OCD logic wins in arguments all the time, because it doesn't follow the rules of regular everyday logic at all. Because yeah, OCD yeah. has one more yeah, but what if than regular logic can ever answer to. <laughs> Brian says, any tips for severe anxiety going on 15 years? Yeah, exposure and response prevention therapy, Brian. That is that is what I would suggest more than anything else. Purposely allowing yourself to learn that you can handle the discomfort that you experience when you are exposed to things and response prevention, the key component to all of it. And let's remember that E minus RP equals nothing, right? You have to have the response prevention component. Doing the response prevention, allowing for that discomfort and not doing something to make it go away, but learning that you can handle it. Uh, a buddy of mine, Dave Carbonell, therapist in Illinois, he was doing a talk and I was I was watching a recording of it. And he's, he described, I'm paraphrase a little bit here, but he said, my job really is to help people who deal with the fear of things that don't actually happen. And I thought that was really interesting how he described that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tin Man says, how is responsibility OCD centered around contaminating others treated? I, I don't know what that, but uh, contaminating others. I have a family and I've started to avoid pre preparing meals in the kitchen as I'm afraid of accidentally harming them via mistakes, such as not cleaning up appropriately or spreading cleaning chemicals to areas I didn't intend. Well, there's a harm one. Uh, so we have I had that one as a kid. Or you did? Oh. Yeah. When I was Tell like us 11 a little, Nick. or, Tell or us 12, about yeah. I was afraid of leaving stuff on the floor specifically because okay. I thought someone would trip and die, even if it's a piece of paper. Um, but yeah, sometimes it would be germ related. I was I had a lot of contamination OCD as a kid from like ages of five, six to like yeah, maybe 10 or so. And a lot of that was also kind of harm related, afraid of it spreading to others or hurting others because I was like, no, no, I have to make sure everything's perfect. I can't leave water on the floor. I can't. Uh, leave anything you know lying around someone's going to get injured something something's going to happen i'm responsible for the whole world's on my shoulders i guess is, is what ocd had convinced me um you know it doesn't matter if other people leave stuff on the floor i was never mad you know i never i was never mad seeing anyone else be reasonable and be like oh i dropped some crumbs on the floor and i'll sweep them up later that was you know you would think if i believed that stuff i would be like well no one should be doing this uh, but it was always right. it was always just about me it was like well i can't leave stuff on the floor because then i did it intentionally because i thought about it Whereas if someone else, you know, drops something on the floor or, you know, contaminates something by accident, that's fine. That's, you know, they're not guilty of anything wrong. But 
sure. it's me, definitely that's that's the exception right there. Yes, um, when the rules so I, I remember might this be one. differently than mm -hmm. everybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I remember this one. You know, uh, uh, Tin Man, I I actually did a video. Just we do a lot of training videos for our NoCD therapists to show different examples of ERP. And Dr. Nick Farrell, who's one of our regional clinical directors, he was playing the patient, and and his fear was, uh, did I accidentally put a chemical onto my kid's food? And and so we role played that, and he actually took a a a you know just plastic jug of cleaner and put it on the counter. And then we had him get food out of the refrigerator and make a sandwich right next to the, to the bottle. And, and the reality, he actually did feed those <laughs> sandwiches to his children when they got home. Although uh, they had lettuce on it and they threw the lettuce off because they said they don't eat leaves. So they didn't like the lettuce, but, but they, they ate the rest of them. And um, you know, I, I, Hey, hope that that shows, this is a pretty common example because we actually used it in a training video that we met or that we made. But two, that OCD, of course, being the doubting disorder that it's nicknamed, will always lead you to doubt. What if I might have done something right? I mean, it is it is the what if disorder. What if I accidentally harmed them by a mistake. And I love that. And and I always love the qualifiers there too, right? What if I accidentally harmed someone by a mistake, right? Or what if I I accidentally didn't clean up something appropriately and I accidentally spread some chemicals to areas I didn't mean to and then and then inadvertently I touched that and then then that touched the bread and then my child ate it or something. Uh, we've even seen real event OCD around there where people were afraid that they they uh one guy who was afraid he had done some cocaine in an area where someone could have put a purse down on it. And then what if she brought her purse home and then she put the purse down on her table and the, the cocaine residue that had been on the place that he had done the cocaine from absorbed into the purse, then fell off the purse onto the table. And then the next morning uh, put a couple of lucky charms out on the table and then they absorbed the cocaine residue and then the kid ate it and the kid got a taste of cocaine at two. And now it was like for the rest of their life was going to be searching for that cocaine that I can finally get. And I can finally feel that rush that I got when I ate those lucky charms when I was two years old. Right. Uh, these, these are amazingly common kinds of concerns. And I would highly recommend you work with an ERP therapist who can help you through these fears and recognize that these fears don't have to stop you from cooking or making food for your family or enjoying time with your family as well. Too. That's called a, what is that? Infinite transference or something like, is that what it's referred to as? Yeah. yeah great example. So a buddy of mine is Brett Deacon. Brett has done a lot of research in the anxiety world. He did an example in a classroom once where he took a piece of dog poop from his dog in a baggie and brought it into the classroom of the class he was teaching. He then took out a box of brand new sharpened pencils, and there were 20 pencils in the box. He took the first pencil and he stuck it into the dog poop. Then he took it out and he threw the dog poop away. Then he took that pencil and touched it to another pencil. Then he put that pencil down. Then he took that pencil, touched it to another. He did that until he was at the 20th pencil. And he said, now, who is willing to touch the pencil? And there were people who said, no, it's got dog poop on it. Right. Because as long as you can see the chain, you can picture in your head that infinite transfer of bacteria or germ or contamination to something, to something, to something. But if you truly think about that, Nick, and I think you'd agree with me, then the entire world is contaminated. There's oh, nothing yeah. that's clean whatsoever. If that's the case. And people with OCD, they can we can really see we don't have to just see a line of pencils happening in front of us. We can remember and I'll I remember once I was afraid of rats. And I remember once there was one in our yard and I thought they were dirty too. I had contamination OCD and my dad trapped one using a, a broom, like one of those um, straw brooms. Sure. And then we ended up like throwing it out or whatever. And we still had that broom and I saw him using it to sweep. I wouldn't touch it, of course, but right. he was using it to sweep the floors. And I walked on those floors and didn't remember spots not to step on. And so then my shoes were contaminated. I went to a friend's house. I was on, you know, on the floor and I think I, my hand touched the floor at one point. And so there was on my hand. And then later we were playing Simon Says and he told me to touch my hand to my face and I freaked out and he was like, what's wrong? And I explained that whole chain and everything. I just told him the whole thing. I'm like, no, I, I, the rat touched this and then this and then this and then my hand and now it's on my face. And he just said, you're weird. 
because I was like 12 <laughs> and he was 12. And then the, that was the end of our hangout. But after that, I thought about it a little bit and I was like, yeah, I guess that sounds absurd when I say it out loud. <laughs> it was all happening in my head. That was the first time I said it out loud. Well, Nick, I'm glad you brought that up because isn't it fascinating even when you go into therapy and have to even sometimes explain something to a therapist, when you finally have to say something out loud to someone, mm -hmm. how sometimes ridiculous it sounds because as you said, in your head, it was making sense. Right, right. Yeah, it, that was my first experience of that, but it's happened. It is not the last. It was not the last. Yeah. David asks, can you have psychosis and OCD intrusive thoughts? Uh, there are, it is a possibility to have both of them. Uh, but I don't want that question to be reassurance of, oh my gosh, now how do I know what's OCD versus intrusive thoughts and, and uh, psychosis or something of that nature? But, you know, anytime that you have concerns about these, you go through a very good diagnostic interview for someone to help you really figure out what it is that is going on and where therapy can come in or medications can come in to be able to help you. Okay. We are halfway through our night already. Uh, welcome uh, once again, everyone, to tonight's webinar, Wednesday night webinar with NoCD. I'm Dr. Patrick McGrath, Chief Clinical Officer here at NoCD. And if you're looking for teletherapy in the U.S. or Canada or the United Kingdom or Australia, check out the NoCD app. Uh, download it for free at Google Play or iOS or go to NoCD.com and we would be more than happy to assist you in getting your therapy needs met. Kelly says, hello, I think I've got a pretty good handle on my harm OCD. Oh, there we go. Excellent. I still have the feelings of doom. It's like a dark place. This symptom won't seem to lift. I've had it for about a year. Can you tell me why? Nick, was there a kind of ever residual feelings or doom or anything that you yeah, had? For a while? Um, that sounds very familiar. Um, yeah. Cause you start to, you start, when I started my treatment, it's like, okay, I'm getting the handle on the anxiety being debilitating. What about this just general feelings of just, you know, bad or doom. Doom is a perfect word. Um, it's like something might happen or may happen and I'm not thinking about it. I'm doing good avoiding compulsions, but I just feel bad like almost all the time it seems. And I think a key here, again, the lights go off when I see like a, I've had it for about a year you'll know that you're doing a lot better, at least in practice, when you're not tracking how long it's been and you're living your life. And I know for me, that's what got me hung up is I wasn't just, uh, you know, I'm not going to track it. I'm not going to see how long this doom is sticking around or, how, you know, I'm not going to, once I stopped letting it interfere with my life, I also eventually, it took me forever to learn my lesson and start doing better, but not to track it either and to just live life and not, um, eventually the doom comes and goes. Sometimes I still experience it, sure. Sometimes I still feel bad, anxious, whatever. But I know um, I definitely experienced this and I definitely it took me a very long time to practice and learn like to leave it behind and not focus on it and keep living life in spite of it. Cody says, hey, I keep getting the thought in my head. I'm going to kill my daughter today. Obviously, I have harm OCD and this is very annoying as it runs on a constant loop over and over and over. Unsure of what to do. I try to just let the thoughts be at times. It seems like if I'm not having the thoughts, I'm purposely bringing them up. My anxiety is low with them, more annoyed and in a loop. Did you ever have that where it got to more of an annoying kind of phase at times, Nick? At all? Yeah, it's even at that sometimes now when it does come up, if anything, like, oh, this old one again, you know, right. when it when it pops in. I'm, annoyance is sometimes my first response. Um especially when it's something that's like, wait, I dealt with this one before. Come on, next. Like, it's a, there's an impatience um, and sometimes an unwillingness to, you know, like, okay, time for more ERP. Sometimes it's that, it's that hesitancy. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm just annoyed. I did this already. I don't want to, I don't want to keep having to deal with this, but it's, it's not a good enough excuse to not, you know, keep doing the work and to keep practicing the ERP. Yeah. And, Cody, I'm glad that you brought up the idea that your anxiety is low with them. And I want everyone to hear that because there are, of course, some people with OCD that have this, that if their anxiety gets low, then are afraid, oh my gosh, I'm not anxious about this anymore. What does that say about me as a person? Does that mean that I like the thought or something? No. The goal is really indifference to anything that is able to pop into your head. You know, if, if I'm on a staircase because I've treated so many people who, who are afraid they'd push people downstairs that now if Nick and I are ever at a conference together and Nick were next to each other on a staircase, I will think about throwing you down the stairs. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's going to pop. You know, I'll have that same thought. Same <laughs> <consolation. laughs> All right. So I'm going to be a hundred percent indifferent to that thought though. I, it will, 
it will not arouse anything in me. It will not bother me. It will not lead to other thoughts about, oh my gosh, should I hold the railing on this side with both hands now or put my hands in my pocket to, to make sure that, that I don't uh, push Nick down the stairs? Should I fake needing to tie my shoes so you'll keep walking down the stairs and get away from me? And uh, none of that's going to pop into my head because I'm going to be utterly indifferent to, to the thought and have no anxiety about it. And that's kind of where we're at. Now, the annoyance factor I wonder, Nick, if you think that kind of goes similar to the previous thought as well, too. If we're tracking, if it's annoying us potentially, then it's going to be annoying to us. Or could we just say, okay, well, uh, I'm going to go out with my daughter today, probably going to kill her. And um, yeah, let's go have a great day at, at the amusement park or something like that. And and I almost wonder if something like that takes, as the Irish would say, takes the Mickey out of it, right? It pulls the rug out from under OCD. So instead of it hopping in in the middle of the amusement park going, you might kill your daughter on the ride, you might kill your daughter. You just say before you get there, well, I might kill my daughter today at the amusement park and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's that mentality of kind of like, well, let's see. Let's see. We're not, I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going to avoid it. Let's see what happens. And if you're at the point where the anxiety is low, it's a little easier to do that. Cause it's like, well, yeah, like I'm, I'm annoyed and I have a little bit of anxiety, but I'm going to do it anyways. And I'm going to see, you know, what's going to happen. And if I, let's see, I'm not going to focus too much on it. I'm just going to, um, kind of sit with it and go about my day. Cause annoyance can kind of ruin an experience or a day just as much as doom can or anxiety. Um, oh, I think sure. it should be treated kind of the same way, you know, you know, hundred percent. I agree with you. You know, one of the things I've rallied against in the diagnostic criteria for OCD is that it just really talks about anxiety in the diagnostic manual, but it's more than that. It's, mm -hmm. it's disgust, it's annoyance, it's grief, it's shame, it's fear. It's all sorts of things. It's not, it's not just feeling anxious about something. There's, there's so many more things that can come along with it. Yeah. Uh, Kayla says, advice for those struggling with real event OCD. Well, advice number one, reach out to a therapist who specializes in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder so that they can absolutely help you. And Anna says, any tips on postpartum OCD? The same answer applies there as well, too. You know, the the goal in any of these kinds of questions is is going to be for us to hopefully motivate you to talk to someone and work with someone and do the exercises in ERP with someone who can guide you through the experience of recognizing that you don't have to trust everything that pops into your head and believe it to be true or real. You know, Nick, you've probably heard me use the harm example that I use in this all the time of what if I leave this webinar up to you for a little while while I run across the street with a Molotov cocktail and throw it at my neighbor Dave's house, then go in the middle of the street, poop in a bag, light it on fire, put it in front of my neighbor Josh's house, ring the doorbell. He's going to come out, see the poopy bag on fire, stomp on it. And then I'm going to shoot a couple of geese on my way home, come back into the webinar and then rejoin the webinar and think nothing of it whatsoever. Yeah. Now, I have used that example for about two years now. As far as I can tell, it hasn't happened yet because every time I look outside, I see my neighbor Dave's house. Mm -hmm. haven't noticed a scorch mark on it yet but maybe, maybe he's rebuilt and I just don't remember who knows, right. but I'm going to live with the doubt that I have about something of that nature. And, uh, you know, I do have some alcohol bottles and some rags and the ability to light things on fire in my house. So I have all the makings of a Molotov cocktail right here in order to be able to even do such a thing. So I'll have to just sit with knowing that I've handled a bottle of alcohol. I've held a rag and I've, I've had, uh, you know, even on the stove upstairs, I've had the flame on. So there's, there's every ability of my life right now to create one of those and to put that into motion. I have a paper bag. Uh, I could poop in it if I forced myself to, and I could light that on fire. And, and, you know, I could make all of these things happen very simply, right? But just because I have the ability to do such a thing, of course, doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Just like, any real event thing that I have doesn't mean that it actually did happen. And any of the cons concerns or things that pop into my head with postpartum OCD also don't mean that those are going to happen as well too. I'll bet though that those thoughts and images and urges you were experiencing around harm felt very real to you. Oh yeah, hundred percent. They were going to happen. It was, it was just facts. I was just, you know, Shitana says, uh, finally able to make one of these live. Well, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Thank you so much. 
Jen says, how do you know the difference between health OCD and a true need to see the doctor? Well, if you've gone to see the doctor about something and they've given you the clear and you've gone back and they've given you a clear and you've run tests and they've given you the clear and then you go back again and they give you a clear, then you see other doctors because you don't trust the first doctors. I mean, those are kind of where I get to the point where I start doubting and wondering if maybe this is uh, some kind of thing, right? Um, you know, I, I'm never going to tell somebody, don't go to a doctor, right? That that's You're not going to hear those words come out of my mouth if it's something that you're experiencing that you've, you've never really had before, right? But if you've dealt with this over and over, you've had numerous test results, you've sought out every medical book that you can, uh, Dr. Google has become your very best friend in the entire world, and you don't believe anybody if they tell you anything but, yes, you've got a problem, then we're really looking at some OCD issues going on there. Sam asks, can you explain control and influence? My therapist told me to focus on how that's affecting my patterns. Well, what I talk about all the time is that we're not really in control of anything, but once we attempt to be, we're going to be in a lot of trouble, right? Nick, how much did you attempt to control your thoughts? 100%. 100%. How does that work? 0% <laughs> success. 0% <laughs> success. Okay. So... I often talk about the notion that control is an illusion, right? We have something in our brain that says we can control the images, the urges, the thoughts that we have. And if we could just get to that, we wouldn't have any problems. I still haven't figured out how to control my own thoughts, nor have I been able to explain to anyone else, or Nick, you weren't able to in all the time you attempted to gain any control over those things, right? Now, there's things throughout the day that can influence you, right? Nick, I'm going to bet that there were days that you felt fine and there were other days where maybe a commercial came on and and even if there was a sword in the commercial or something, like it was a, a Kill Bill movie uh, commercial or something like that, that, that would have influenced you and, and had you thinking about all sorts of things throughout that day. Oh, yeah. So many triggers. So many. Yeah, so many influencers. Sure. Just going into a deli, maybe, and seeing them take a knife out and cut some, cut some bologna or something like that, or, or, or hearing the a sharpening of a knife even happen or something of that nature could have, could have done it. Just flipping through YouTube and and seeing what's in the scroll and and all you need to see is band stabbed and local you know mall or something of that nature and, and oh yeah, the news is the worst. Yeah, <laughs> the news is yeah. the worst. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had someone influenced by a hit and run uh, report where she actually called the police on herself, even though she hadn't even driven that day, uh, but just wanted to be sure that that it wasn't her, even even mm -hmm. though it couldn't have been, but just needed that needed that 100 percent assurance on, on something of that nature. So we're definitely not out to be able to control our thoughts because nobody's figured that out yet. And what we want to be able to do is to recognize there are things that will influence us to, us to feel the way we feel, but we want to make those into ERP exercises. So Sam, if you had things that are, are, have influenced you and Nick, if there are things that influenced you, we would want to make those into ERP exercises. So that's why you carry that knife around, right? And what that knife may have influenced in the past doesn't influence today, I'm going to bet. Right. Natural B says, my OCD is triggered by day-to-day uh, -day life. ERP in my therapy sessions isn't triggering me. What do I do? Well, then what I would want to do, natural B, is, is to take a look at the way you're reacting to things in, in your natural everyday life and then plan for when that thing happens instead of doing what I usually do. Here's the compulsions I always do. I'm purposely going to do this then when, when that happens. So maybe ERP feels like it's too much of a simulation for you. Okay. Uh, there are times then that I've had members of mine go for a walk and put your phone in your pocket, let the camera be up, put your earbuds in. And let's say, I'm going to use a harm example, Nick. All right. Just since you're here, if, if it would have been too, 
weird for you or, or just wasn't triggering enough for you to maybe sit with a family member while I'm telling you to and hold a knife uh, toward them. And you would have been like, yeah, this isn't bothering me because I know you're watching me or you're here or something like that. Or they know that I'm not going to do it or something like that. Okay. Nick, go for a walk, put your phone in your pocket, put your earbuds in and keep that knife in your pocket. We're going to walk down the street. And anytime somebody comes past you, I want you to stick your hand in your pocket and hold your knife. And I want you to think I could stab this person if I chose to, right? Much more naturalistic kind of in that situation. And we could practice that. Now, according to natural B, maybe when we practice it together, it's not so triggering, but guess what natural B? I want you then to purposely bring things with you like a knife that's in your pocket so that in the future, if someone does walk past you and that is in your pocket and you have that initial thought of, oh my God, I could do it. You make that into an ERP right then and there in that situation, in that real life situation, even though the therapist isn't with you. How did you go about for yourself, Nick, making exposures for yourself that would be kind of in your day-to-day -day stuff? Because you would have had to do this too when your therapist- Yeah, that was key. I got to this point where it was like in therapy, we would do an exposure and she'd ask, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm not feeling anxious at all. This all feels like fake. <laughs> you know, it's something about the grounding of, you know, working with a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, let's say it's at night when I'm alone and, you know, it's dark and like for whatever reason, situational triggers may be um, where depending on the situation, I feel more vulnerable or, you know, the things are more dangerous in this scenario. And that's when I would talk to her about that. That's the first thing I did, bring it to the therapist um, and discuss, like, I guess, homework uh, that you can do. And that's when I started to really crack down on, like, okay, identifying what are those situations and how can I put myself in them even more and make them more dangerous and more scary so that when it's just the day-to-day, -day, you know, it, it no longer, like, the, the anxiety used to go up to here, but I've been pushing it up to here on purpose. So now when it's just up to here, it, it slowly would start to decrease because I noticed I was practicing it and pushing it further um, to yeah. the point where I started to realize, yeah, this no longer is a trigger in therapy with a therapist or on my own because I'm doing both regularly and learning. That's that's kind of where the good stuff comes in is when you're by yourself and thrown the good into, stuff. you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, that's where you find, that's where you really learn about yourself. And um, that's when you know you're things. becoming an ERP junkie when you're suddenly yeah. enjoying the ERPs that are coming. Yeah, like, oh, that's going to be a fun one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jen says, hi, Jen. Good to see you again. How do I know if I'm doing enough exposures every day? That sounds like an OCD Red question flag, right yeah. off the bat. So <laughs> uh, is, is there such a thing as enough, right? Or enough uh, of what I'm supposed to do? Uh, Jen, I don't want to answer that question in the world of enough because I don't want that to be like well, OCD can interfere with treatment. And we know that right off the bat. So OCD is going to say, well, okay, you want to get rid of me? Fine. I understand it, but just know you have to perfectly get rid of me in order to get rid of me. So you have to know exactly what's enough exposures to do in order for everything for me to go away or everything to be okay like that. So I don't, I don't want to tell you that there's enough exposures to do every day. I, I just tell people, take advantage of the fact that when something is bothering you and you would normally do a compulsion, try not to do the compulsion and allow yourself to learn from that experience. And that's that in and of itself is enough. Marco says, hello, I suffer from HOCD, which now we're calling sexual orientation OCD because it's not just people who are afraid of what if I would become homosexual, but it's any kind of gender orientation. So I suffer from sexual orientation OCD and was wondering if it's possible to be able to climax the thoughts of sex you fear you're attracted to. Yes, 100%. And it's one of the ways that people test themselves all the time is they might watch pornography of the kind that they fear. What if I were to like that and masturbate? And then when they do have an orgasm, think, oh my gosh, that must be proof of this. When mm -hmm. no, it's because you were client you were masturbating. <laughs> I mean, that's that's why that's why the climax occurred. It it didn't really matter what was on 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 the porn or the television or something of that nature. So absolutely something like that uh, would be a test. And we would not encourage people to keep testing themselves like that because then people use that just more and more as proof that maybe I really am this thing and that I don't want to be this thing and what is it and everything. So that wouldn't be what we would do for ERP. We would do quite the opposite of something of that nature, right? We, we wouldn't be looking at it from a test point of view. Yes. Yeah, that checking behaviors and you know, that's a, that's compulsive. I, I don't know a lot of checking in my day. It's, could you, it doesn't get you to an answer. Yeah. Nick, could you ever have checked enough to be convinced about something? No, never. Hmm. It didn't go away till I stopped checking. Yeah. There's also some interesting research out, Nick. I don't know if you've seen this that shows that 
the more you check, actually, the less confident you become in something as you check more. So your first check is actually the most confident check. And every check after that has a little bit less confidence in it than the check before did. Mm -hmm. right. I believe it. I felt that. Yeah. yeah. Boy says, hi, Doc. Currently, I have an obsession that involves what if I'm being touched by spirits, energy, evil, etc. Uh, these thoughts give me uh, uncomfortable sensations. And in return, I uh, do some fidgeting and it sounds like try to reason through them as well, too. Um, so, boys, I mean, first of all, uh, what happens if you don't do those compulsions, right? I would say not to fidget or touch certain things that you might use to ground yourself or be lucky and just allow for the fact that, okay, I can feel as if a spirit has touched me or, or, or walked next to me or something of that nature. But just because I feel that doesn't make that true or real. I'm Nick, I'm reminded of one we did once. Uh, we had someone who said, I'm, I'm afraid I might've sold my soul to the devil. I, I don't know if I did or how I would actually do it. And I, at the end of the webinar, invited every demonic possessor of, of in, in any kind of nature whatsoever onto the webinar. And I said that I would auction my soul off to them. No, no one showed up though. So uh, either, either I have no soul or those that's just right. not what happens in, in the world or anything of that nature. So, so boys, I'm going to bet that as you do the compulsions you do and get that instantaneous feeling better, it just leads to more need to do the compulsions, right? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a learning aspect in OCD and maybe Nick, you felt this as well too, that the more compulsions you did, the more you actually needed to do, right? You, yeah, you sure. can almost learn that the obsession though it's uncomfortable, becomes the only way to deliver the thing that is comfortable, which is the compulsion. And so therefore, you see this learning that occurs without actually knowing it, that more obsessions occur in order to get more compulsions done to get more relief in my life. Yeah, it's what negative reinforcement, I think. You're taking, you're, you're, I'm getting anxiety and I'm doing something to take it away, right? I think that's that's negative reinforcement yeah negative reinforcement is the removal of an aversive stimuli right? yeah and and an increase in behavior that that we see so in this kind of situation you're you know you're really experiencing almost the creation of something aversive in order to bring about something then that removes it because of how good i feel in that so there's there's definitely a a, a, a interesting kind of reinforcement concept that occurs there yeah, yeah. Uh, Jupiter says, I have schizophrenia OCD. Uh, I create a scary voice in my head that basically represents my intrusive thoughts. I can control what it says, but I've convinced myself it's schizophrenia and can't turn it off. So convincing ourselves of something doesn't make something real, right? Um, Nick, you probably convinced yourself you were a dangerous person to other people, mm -hmm. and yet as you said, time and time again, it never, it never did become real. So Jupiter, the fact that you feel like you can control what it says is awesome. And I would reach out to a therapist then who can, who can help you then deal with your interpretation of the meaning of it as well too, because uh, just because you've convinced yourself it's schizophrenia doesn't actually mean that it is. Again, just though I have convinced myself that my skin is green, does not actually mean that my skin is green, even though I've convinced myself that it is, right? So there's a big difference between what I've convinced myself into believing and what actually is going on in a situation. And an OCD can convince you of a lot of things. Nick, you probably had this all the time. You were convinced of many, many things that had actually no proof whatsoever to verify that they were actually true. Absolutely. Even a little bit of schizo, you know, especially when I was pre-high school, I, that was one of my fears. So I even had a similar thing. I'm like, oh, I'm convinced that it's got to be something. Yeah. Can a fear of depression or becoming suicidal be OCD? Well, yes, of course. There it is. Yeah, there we go. If so, how to deal with that? So, of course, once OCD grabs onto something, it's going to get you to look for it. And once you start looking for something, guess what happens? You find it, right? And now that you find it, you use that as proof that it's true and real. 
And therefore, you need to do something to neutralize it. Or if you don't, then something bad will happen. And it will be your fault because you didn't take the opportunity to neutralize it. And then you'll feel good for a while, but then wonder, did I get all of it, though? Was it, So maybe I should check again. And now we're on the hamster wheel of hell. And we're going around and around and around and around. And Nick, I'll bet you lived that hamster wheel for a long time in your life. Right? Oh, yeah. With every theme, that was always, that was something that was kind of, constant amongst them all is it always would just go in circles until i either got tired gave up on it or ddrp tom says uh patrick you're the best i've ever seen well thanks tom i <laughs> appreciate that uh i'm wondering is everyone just got stuck on the actual word ocd repeating in your thoughts uh it, it could happen right and so uh one of the things that I've done with people is when they've had things stuck like this, kind of like even a song stuck in your head, the very best way to get rid of something stuck in your head isn't trying to make it go away. In fact, it's doing the opposite. It's making a loop tape of it and just listening to it over and over and over and over again until you're so bored with it. Uh, I did this example once with someone who had social anxiety and it, it's outside of OCD, but it's, it's such a fun example. He was the youngest of five boys, and he said that his older brothers just teased him relentlessly about stuff. And so we got a list of, of all of the names and things that his brothers teased him about or called him. And all of my colleagues got around a tape recorder, because this was over 20 years ago, so loop tapes were on an actual cassette tape. And we recorded for a minute all of us just yelling those things into the tape. I gave him the tape, and I had him listen to it. The first hour was really rough. He was even a little tearful. And hour two, he was kind of neutral. Hour three, he came to me and said, this is getting a little ridiculous. Can I stop listening to this tape? I, I don't even believe this stuff anymore. I said, great, listen to it for another hour now. By hour four, he was laughing at the tape. And, and he was able to say to me, I can't believe after four hours, these words that bothered me for 20 years are now laughable. That's all it took was four hours of listening to those things over and over again. But what would happen in his daily life? He heard one of those things and he would hide away from it. He would run. He would, he would have to then do research and convince himself he wasn't one of these things and everything like that. And he kept doing all of these compulsive kinds of behaviors and reassurance seekings to try to be sure that he wasn't one of these things. When just allowed to sit with it and to hear them for what they were. They're just words. That's all that they were. They they didn't have to have any kind of meaning or anything whatsoever. After a few hours, he was able to say, I can't believe I wasted so much time in my life being bothered by these words. They're stupid. And they don't have to mean anything reflective of me as a person whatsoever. And it was a really great experience. So Tom, I hope that you're able to have something like that happen for you as well too. Well, Nick, as I said to you, this hour goes by fast. We're, we're at the top of the hour already. Uh, once again, everyone, Wednesday night webinar brought to you by No CD. So happy to have all of you here with us. It's been a pleasure. And Nick, any final words of of inspiration and wisdom for all of the people out there watching tonight? I'd, I'd like to give you the last word here. Yeah, to piggyback a little bit on what you were talking about, I, I've noticed too. Like for for him, it was four hours. You say. Um, but and for everyone, it's different. But you'd be you'd be surprised for anyone hesitant about the treatment or about really taking those risks and you know accepting uncertainty. Anyone who has any hesitancies, I can speak from personal experience because I was very much there, hesitant. You'd be surprised at just how quick you can start to see yourself grow and develop and progress with OCD treatment. Even if something that's bothered you your whole life and you're convinced you'll never get better, you'd be really surprised to just see once you really start to embrace that uncertainty and the treatment and ERP, like just how beneficial it can be and how quickly. Awesome. Well, Nick, it's an honor that we were able to work with you through No CD, and I'm so happy for the success that you've had. And thank you for being here. And thank you. you. Know, hey, you're always welcome back anytime. So if it's something of interest, yeah, absolutely. I'd love happy to. to have you. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. We'll be back again next Wednesday. Good to see you, everybody. Take care, guys.
Thank you.